There are other approaches and forms of non-invasive treatment for obstructive sleep disorders, but they are palliatives as they don't resolve the cause. They involve the use of CPAP, continuous positive airway pressure or CPP or mandibular advanced devices. There is a silence cries in the Western world. In the left hand column are signs and symptoms typically found in children. Research has shown that four in every five children in USA suffer from one or more of these conditions. And on the right, there are signs and symptoms typically found in adults. Research show that in general, about nine out of 10 Americans suffer from one or more of these conditions. It's time for a dentist to look beyond teeth. There are lots of opportunity out there that we could be using to help our patients. So my takeaways is, I mentioned so many treatments here and rarely the word teeth. Are we really only doctors of teeth? Are we using everything we know to care for our patients? Are we seeing our patients as a whole or just a mouthful of teeth? It's time for dentistry to change. What's your role as dentist in the 21st century? If you want to change the way you do dentistry, you may want to implement integrative orofacial medicine in your practice and join the sleep medicine revolution. You might want to start using um, photonic devices, treat patients with oral cancer and patients with chronic pain. The time is now. Everyone who wants an, any extra information, please feel free to email me. I would like to invite you to visit our websites. We run training on all aspects of integration of new technology into the practice. We have a specialized support line to help you define what's the best training for you based on your practice need. Anyone who wants any extra information, please feel free to contact me. A lot of what I learned in integrative sleep dentistry, I owe to the various training I have received. There will be another two major events in this sleep medicine in November and December, which I'll be participating. I have learned a great deal from their airway summits. If you are interested, I highly encourage you to, you to participate. I've managed to request a code for the attendees of this webinar specifically to get free entry to these events. So if you are interested, please take a screenshot of the screen. This webinar will also become permanently available at the end of the presentation. And you can also register on the link below to get CE credits. And now I will leave you with a very short video on the link between sleep disorder breathing and ADHD. And we'll come back after it for your questions and answer session. So stay tuned and thank you for listening to me. take a child, alter their quality of breathing and sleeping. And the real big issue now is how will they be during the day? So now you take a child who's five, six, seven, eight, it doesn't matter. Their issue has begun years ago. So it's not like you had one or two bad nights of sleep. You've had a poor quality of sleeping and breathing for years. And the parents have been struggling with so many different issues and not the least of which is the ADD, ADHD discussion. Because the child who doesn't get a proper night's sleep with a good quality of breathing throughout the entire night is gonna wake up and be unrested. And when you get a child who's had a poor quality night's sleep, poor breathing all night long, and you make that happen for years, you know what you've got, a six, seven, or eight year old that's gonna go to school and have trouble learning, have trouble sitting still, have trouble behaving, have trouble cooperating, basically have trouble 
fitting in to what is supposed to be a quiet and peaceful and learning environment. And it's not long after that where the phone call comes to the parent. And when the phone call comes to the parent from the school, what happens is we have little Jimmy here and he's a little bit disruptive and we really want you to have him evaluated for ADD and ADHD. They're going to be diagnosed with ADD and ADHD and our solutions are pharmaceutical. If we are given a pharmaceutical, it's usually in the form of some sort of a stimulant. And what that does to the child is it kind of pushes them over the edge and it brings them back to calm. So you basically take an excited or hyperactive child, you stimulate them more, and you bring them back to so-called calm. But it doesn't make a better learning child. You're not going to have a child who's able to learn as well. So now you might have the child sitting still in class because they might be a little more numb or relaxed or calm, but it doesn't necessarily make them a better learner. If we have the so-called ADD, ADHD diagnosis, we're talking about hyperactivity. We're talking about all of the things about behavior and development that land in this category. And the interesting thing about research is, and there is current, ongoing, and past research that shows, children who are sleep deprived produce the same exact symptoms as kids who are diagnosed with ADD and ADHD. In fact, there's a nice study that showed children who were diagnosed with ADD and ADHD were mixed with children who were sleep deprived. And in that group of kids, when they tried to analyze them and look at their symptoms and diagnose them, they couldn't tell them apart. And if you have a group of kids and you can't tell apart who's an ADD child and who's a sleep deprived child, it's no surprise that maybe the ADD and ADHD has a cause. And maybe that cause has to do with the quality of the breathing and the sleeping overnight. And there's a lot of research out there. And one of the, one of the pioneers here is a Dr. Stephen Sheldon out of Lori Children's Hospital in Chicago. And he does a wonderful job of researching, and over the decades, he's come to a conclusion, and I, I've, I've seen him speak, and it's not soon after he jumps on stage and he makes a statement that ADHD and ADD do not exist. They are an outcome of a sleep disorder breathing. They're an outcome of a poor quality of sleep. It's all about the quality of sleep. Another researcher who's produced beautiful research on the same topic is Dr. Karen Bonnick out of Einstein at Yeshiva University. Dr. Karen Bonnick has the largest study to date. 11,000 children were watched over seven years. And they were divided into two groups, sleep disorder breathing children and children who do not have sleep disorder breathing issues. The children in the sleep disorder breathing group, over their seven years, her study showed that they were 50% more likely to be diagnosed with an ADD or ADHD diagnosis and treated with medication. 50% is a coin toss for our child to be diagnosed and treated with a medication. Also in her group, they were doing testing. They were doing IQ or intelligence testing along those seven years. And the children with the sleep disorder breathing, their, their intelligence testing, their IQ scores were dropping over those seven years. And that's really not the way it works when you're growing and forming. The formative growing years for a child when they're sleeping and breathing well, your IQ raises to a certain point and then you kind of plateau. We don't see IQs diminishing amongst children. All right. Uh, I think you're mute. You muted. Okay. Well, uh, well, thank you so much, Dr. Sonia, for such an informative session. It was actually uh, an eye opener uh, for, I think, all the fraternity in the field of dentistry that we are not only limited to teeth, but we are definitely limited to the complete, uh, you can say, the head and neck region and the complete body, uh, metab uh, you can say, the medicine or probably the how the functioning is there. So it was really a deeper insight. And uh, I have a few questions for you, uh, Dr. Sonia, right? Uh, so uh, you have talked about bruxism, right? The bruxism is one thing. So what is this, uh, what we know about the deprogramming? How exactly it is helpful uh, in the child uh, to take care of this uh, bruxism or in adults that we can take care? The deprogramming, what we do generally. The, well, basically, more and more research are coming out now showing that bruxism is actually a mechanism of the body in trying to open the airways for children with, uh, uh, for people with uh, obstructive airways. So not only in the night, but also in the day, a lot of mouth breathers. So um, is, a, is a lot, a lot of new research coming out in the literature. Uh, for many years, we always thought it was just related to uh, either uh, uh, was uh, anxiety or other, yes. other reasons, malocclusion, but now is a big link uh, related to airway. And we have seen this in patients when we treat 
with the expansion of the airway that we get in the bruxisms to, to stop. So this, we are seeing this on a daily basis with these patients that we are actually treating and improving the airway. So I think that one thing I've learned, I really feel bad how I did dentistry 30 years ago, but at the same time, I feel I'm happy in the 21st century too, because a lot of things you just have to relearn and so much is coming out. And I have a lot of colleagues that are getting to sleep medicine and many times they say, but my patient uh, say to me, doctor, I came here for perio. Why you want to look at my airway? And that apparently uh, put them a little bit off of doing uh, other things that they were used to because they think the patients are, uh, are going to think is it strange, a dentist doing airway. But all they need to do is to look, show them the American Dentist Association recommendation that all dates should be screening for airway. And one of the problem uh, of the, the root cause of the airway uh, sleep, obstructive sleep uh, disorder breathing is the uh, lack of, is the, the smaller growth of our maxilla and mandible. So we are being pushing backwards and backwards because of our Western culture um, habits. We're not breastfeeding enough. We're giving soft food to our kids. Uh, we're missing out a lot of tongue ties. And, and this is a myriad of reasons why we should be uh, actually telling this patient, hey, you are lucky I'm looking at your airway and not to be scared of them wanting to go away from, from us offering it to them. I don't know if I so, answered your question. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, there's another question like, is there any specific age in which we can diagnose a sleep apnea? Absolutely not. We start okay. as early as babies. We now have a, a special ring that we can use in little babies. Do you know the cot death? Yeah. There's a huge link of cot death with sleep, sleep apnea. Those babies are dying because they have sleep disorder. So this is an ep epidemic. And yes, we, we, we screen pa pa patients from any age. And we treat patients from all age group, from baby all the way up to 90 years old. So is there any uh, like uh, specialized imaging technique that you recommend that the, the dentist should go for when they are uh, like, okay, this is one spec like imaging that is must to diagnose that uh, sleep apnea or uh, this, uh, this thing? Yes, you definitely need a, to be able to see the airway volume and everything. You really need the CBCT scan. It has okay. to go from the top of the head, the elite, ideally to C5 or at least C3. So we need a full CBCT scan, which we can then measure. And, and from that, uh, you can see the whole system. You can see the airway and the uh, nasal airway. You can see the oropharynx airway, everything. Uh, so yes, that's what we use as our uh, standardized image. And then we always do the sleep tests too. But many okay. times the sleep test can show no apnea, hypopnea index, but it shows upper resistance airway, like with a high or high uh, RDI, which is that patient is still suffering, but because they don't spend 10 seconds without breathing, they are, their in the apnea, apnea index is low, but they still can have a huge fragmented sleep throughout the night. Awesome. Uh, there is one thing people are always confused, like we should go for a CPAP or a BiPAP. Always there is a confusion like CPAP is for sleep apnea or a BiPAP for a sleep apnea. So how you differentiate exactly that this, which is recommended? Well, I really, for me, normally uh, is the doctor, uh, the, the pulmonologist or sleep doctor that actually would work recommending the CPAP or BiPAP. To me, I don't like thinking about palliatives. 
if my huge philosophy is to treat the root cause and try to expand this airway, which you can do now with the biomimetic devices. And it's the dentist who can do it, nobody else. If you go to a doctor, all he can do is to say, okay, put you on a CPAP forever. And it's well Absolutely. known now that uh, even if you're with a CPAP, patients get worse over time. So if you start with a 40 <laughs> index, you in a few years, you may be with a 50 or 60 and you carry that thing forever. So the main objective is to understand that we, we dentists are the core of this. We can provide solution. We can provide the definitive treatment. When nothing against CPAP, some people might not be a candidate or might not want to try intraoral uh, expansion. But um, we need to, to, to be at the front of this because we are the only one who can actually treat this, this condition permanently. Uh, yes, there is CPAP, the mandibular advanced device, which eventually can cause problems with the TMJ. So to me, I, I don't like to, to work with those, but many times you as you refer to the doctor, this is your alternative, that's what you have to do. For some reason, they're not a candidate. Many times they're not candidate for uh, our treatment. So they end up having to go and, but that specific, what is better for each patient, that's normally is the med medical doctor who will define. So uh, what are the different ways of the myofunctional therapy that what exactly you recommend that uh, the doctor should advise uh, to the patients, especially when they are in the sleep apnea? To me, my, myofunctional therapy has to be part of the team. Like okay. all the time. Why? Because a lot of these patients, they are mouth breathers. They're not, they have not breathing, been breathing through their nose, nose for years because they, for whatever reason, they're having a, a dysfunction there or an obstruction. And even if we expand this, this patient will need, needed to learn and relearn how to go back to breathing through their nose and how to swallow properly. They need to have their whole tongue on the roof of their mouth, not just the tip, not just the two first thirds, the whole tongue. And that's our, um, the tongue is what is the, is the function that reshapes the form and that holds that form that we find we finalize with our treatment. So yes, swallowing and nose breathing is fundamental. And I think you saw one of my slides that showed yeah. the patient goes back to their posture. It's like the body knows I don't need to, to you know, compensate for breathing anymore. So fun, function is, is everything. And I, I, every patient I work with, I work along with myofunctional therapy. So I recommend that. Well, well uh, thank you, Dr. Sonia, for your uh, wonderful session. And uh, it was actually, again, a pleasure and honor for us at the Global Summit. We are happy to have you as a part of our team. And you had always been encouraging and uh, supporting to us. And it was a wonderful evening with you to sharing the views on the integrative part of the oral medicine, I think, which is uh, one of the most uh, important part, which is missed, I think, by most of our, of our fraternity. Thank you once again, ma'am, for your uh, very informative and interesting session. And uh, thank you. And we hope to look forward to see you soon for more webinars. Thank you so much and have a great day. Thank you. Same to you. And thank you for the opportunity. Thank you, ma'am. Bye.